welcome everyone to this support session covering covering getting set up to deliver A-level English literature coursework 9ET04. This session is intended to support teachers with starting a fresh cycle of coursework. Most teachers do this in the summer term of year 12 so that students have started or are ready to go when they come back into year 13 in September. All the documents from the session will be, will be available to download from the A-Level English Literature page after the second version of this event, which is going to be on the 13th of June. I should have said at the beginning, this is Claire Haviland, the English Subject Advisor. Thanks very much for joining me today. OK, let's get started. So I'll just run you through, first of all, um, what we're going to be covering, so the agenda for the, the session. So my aim today is really to think about setting up good practice so that the coursework runs really smoothly. In other um, training that's already available and other documents, we've covered um, certain aspects of the coursework. So I'm not going to reiterate that. I'm going to stick to things that we haven't talked about yet. So we're going to talk very briefly about text suitability and title composition, but more in the context of how you cope with this yourself and how you interact with students um, to set up the text and the title composition rather than the rules that the teacher and the and Edexcel tend to discuss. Then we're going to talk about setting up the coursework project as a whole, uh, making sure that students are confident about referencing. Um, then we're going to talk about making sure that students don't go over length, which is a common problem. <clears throat> um, we're going to talk a little bit about the rules on feedback. Uh, again, that's something that teachers think about quite a lot. What can I say? What can I write? What can I do? And then there'll be a question and answer session at the end. As we go through, I'll pause at various points so that you can ask any questions if there's something that obvious that might arise from the, the slide that we've been talking about. OK, so first of all, um, text suitability and setting up student choice. So I hope that you've all seen the A-level literature coursework guidance document. Um, when you get this PowerPoint, there's a link there in due course. We do update that quite regularly um, to, just to reflect what's been happening, what kind of queries have been coming into the coursework advisory service or to myself. So there are different ways that you can set up text choice. You can have completely free student choice and students study both their texts independently. You can have the teacher teaching one text and then offering a short list of the second text, which students study independently. Or you can have a collaborative approach where students choose their own text, they read a range as a group over the summer, and then the class decides together on text pairings. All of those are possible. There are things to think about, though. Um, so there are sort of considerations on any of those. So first of all, if you were to give students completely free choice, what would that mean for you as a teacher? How many unfamiliar texts would you need to familiarise yourself with in order to support the student and in due course mark and authenticate their work? So you need to keep things within the realm of what's feasible. Then a very important consideration is what contextual or critical material is available for the text. So quite often teachers will um, email me and say, um, my student wants to do um, Gone Girl or The Girl on the Train. Is that OK? So the question is really not, will I say, is it OK? The question is, what contextual and critical material is there for either of those texts? If you don't know yourself, has the student um, found out? Have they done some initial research? Because they do have to cover AO3 and AO5. So there isn't much point in choosing a text that doesn't have good um, secondary material available. Um, I guess it's worth pointing out here that all these kind of practical considerations should not detract from what English literature is all about, which is enjoying text and enjoying reading. But 
it is perhaps important to um, draw students' attention to the difference between a book they might read for enjoyment and a book that would be um, really good for coursework because it would offer them the possibility to write a really good piece of coursework and uh, in interact with some really interesting critical material. Um, then a third consideration, it, particularly where teachers are choosing um, the texts and where there might be a limited choice is, do these texts meet the interests or ability range of my group? So it might be that a teacher has got a particular desire to teach a text, but that it doesn't really find any resonance with the students. So that's something to think about. And obviously within the completely open choice you've got of text. Some texts will be much more demanding than others, so it's worth thinking about what your students are likely to be able to cope with well. And the fourth consideration is the timing. If students are reading their coursework texts over the summer, then uh, at what point are you going to set this whole project up? And if you want to do a collaborative approach where you discuss with them what texts they study, then that all has to happen quite early, early on or earlier on than if you've got a more sort of controlled teacher driven perspective, which you could potentially introduce at the beginning of uh, year 13. So let's move on now to thinking about title composition um, and look at a few different composition, uh, a, a few different approaches to how we can do that. Um, so one thing to do is to flag, to go through with students uh, a couple of basic ideas. So one, how to flag AOs in the question, and also to talk about um, question styles that use quotations are quite often quite popular where there's a quotation which sets the scene and then following the quotation uh, there's the title itself. So you could have students proposing um, their own titles with their texts or you could have the teacher presenting to students a list of pre-formulated titles that go with the selected texts and students either choose from the list or they suggest an individualized version of one of them. Another approach is to have an initial title generating session with students and then for students to peer evaluate the different titles that are put forward until you've boiled down a list of titles that work and then students choose from those. Um, <clears throat> and another way that you can do it is to just take some titles and then test them using resource one which is the peer evaluation of proposed coursework titles so let's just have a look at that so i'm going to show you quite a few different resources um, these will all be available to download and for you to adapt um, in any way that is useful for you so let's just get uh, resource one ready so this is resource one so first of all it gives an example so we've got a coursework title here and then we've got a little um, table and this one is completed for this question so there's a whole series of questions which kind of test whether this is a good title that will work so we've got eight different questions and um, the students look at the um, title and decide whether the answer to each is yes or no. So if, if everything's yes, it's a great title. If there are any no's or if anything is unclear, then the student will need to make suggestions about how that part of the question or the title could be improved. <clears throat> so this title example is one um, with a quote and we do sometimes find that there's a problem in that after a quote which may sound really cool and interesting and intellectual the the title that follows it doesn't really link clearly to that quote so in this case um, there are there are sort of some notes here reflecting that so after looking at one example together in this way then um, you could go on to have students either test their own titles or peer evaluation of titles so um, there's a blank version of the table there. So you could obviously take this and adapt it to your own needs. 
Okay, let's move on. And the next thing that we're going to think about is setting up the project as a whole. So, <clears throat> so I'm just going to talk about a few good practice things here. Coursework can feel like something that is going to go on for months and uh, be potentially difficult. That's a bit of a negative view, but sometimes both teachers and students can feel like that. And a way to c combat that is to have a really clear framework at the beginning. So if you can, it's good to provide students with an overview of the whole project, expect showing what your expectations are, how you expect them to work, uh, especially on things like the layout of quotations and referencing, because those are things that if you write the whole coursework in a kind of random way, it takes a long time and a lot of energy to fix afterwards. Whereas if you set up the working practices in advance, the, the work that the students do will be right as they do it with just the occasional little slip. So let's look at another resource um, which demonstrates that. So let's just have a look at resource two. So this is an example of um, a document that you could give to your um, year 13 class and it would demonstrate how everything is going to work. So in this case, um, there are two texts named and then students ch can choose to replace either of those with a shortlist, a separate shortlist. So the, the kind of basics of the whole um, exercise are laid down, how many words that is, what that looks like, using double spacing, that you need word counts. And then you've got a series of proposed deadlines. So you're obviously looking quite far ahead. So this is just a ballpark idea of, of what you expect to happen. So um, what's going to happen over the summer, when a first draft of, is expected, when you'll get the first draft back, and when the final draft is going to be handed in. Then there's a choice of questions. So this will hopefully mean that everyone in your group has got uh, a, t uh, a title which interests them and which is appropriate for their ability level. Then there are some reminders about plagiarism, which is of course very important, the need for bibliography, um, some advice on how to work. Again, just make just trying to uh, prevent the kind of disaster happening that can, you know, the laptop uh, gets a can of coke spilt over it and all the work is lost. How to avoid that sort of thing? Um, and then, um, if you're really organised or if you really like to. Uh, have things uh, all laid down for students, you can give them an idea of what the autumn term might look like in terms of what you're going to be doing with the texts. I mean, this kind of thing is obviously as a teacher it takes a long time to get ready but then once you have got it ready um, you can kind of settle into the work knowing that you'll get to where you need to be at the right time if students are absent, then they know in advance what it is that they're likely to have missed. Um, and it just gives everyone uh, a sense of control. So that's just a document that you could adapt to whatever your particular situation is. I hope this doesn't come across as, you know, uh, being stating the obvious. Um, many of you will have your own working practices, but to some people starting off with doing coursework, it might be a bit less obvious. So that's why I'm just making some of these things available. Um, <clears throat> so then apart from sort of setting the whole project up, there are some other things that you can do. Um, these could either happen during the summer term of year 12, or they could just be dripped into um, year 13 um, according to need, but they're all about different things that are helpful for when students are working on their coursework texts. So let's just have a little look at some of these resources. <clears throat> I think you're going to like uh, resource three and I think students will like it. You may already have something similar, 
Um, but this is just a, a summary of the kind of things that you can say about novels um, in different categories. And I mean, it's not useful only for coursework, in fact. It's obviously useful for the um, prose text for 9ET02 also. But particularly where students are doing um, individual um, studying of novels without class guidance, this gives them a kind of structure of, you know, instead of passively reading, reading more actively. So, right, I'm going to read a chapter of one, of the novel. Um, what is it that I'm focusing on? What am I looking out for? And these are just prompts uh, which are particularly helpful for students who don't perhaps have a wide repertoire of novel novel knowledge, if you like, to, to dwell on. So the more novels you've read, the more sense you have of what the different possibilities are. But if you've read relatively few novels, if you've only read your GCSE texts and a couple of other books, then it might not be so obvious to you that, that everything that the writer does is a choice and these are some of the choices. Okay, let's see what else we've got. So, um, then um, resource four, this is just a simple grid that you could use for class activities. Um, just rem it's just a, a table to collect ideas about the different elements of context. So, um, you know, you could set uh, a section of the novel or one of the other texts to read. And whilst the students are reading, they would um, make notes on this grid or again when they're studying texts autonomously they can gather ideas on this sheet and then use that when they're going back to their coursework and thinking okay I haven't said a great deal about context what else could I say what else have I no noticed as I've uh, read the play or the poem or the novel Source five is about supporting students in getting confident with integrating critics into their coursework or indeed into any of the other um, uh, units where co components where um, critics are assessed. So, so it just starts off by giving the basic principles of what you do when you are including critical views um, into your writing um, and then it gives you an example so these are all sort of linked to that coursework that we had before on things fall apart and Lara <clears throat> so it gives you an example first of all of uh, good practice when um, integrating uh, a critical view it goes through the different things that you need to do, quoting from the critic, making sure that you reference the critic properly, uh, linking the point that the critic has made uh, to a specific part of the text, uh, so supporting it with textual evidence, and then um, the crucial bit of not only reporting what a critic has said, but also interacting with that view and um, writing why you do or don't agree with it or how you could take it further. So the idea is that you, you show students how to do it, it's very simple, and then um, they do the same thing again. They make one more kind of essay, essay style point um, with another argument from the same critic. So this obviously works well if the whole class is studying a critic, but equally, you can do a kind of workshop where you randomly take a critic and a text that um, one person in the group is doing, and then everyone does the exercise so that they can then apply that after all to the text that they're studying. Resource six is a bit different, um, and this is kind of something that you might like to do right at the beginning of a coursework project, so that might be in year 12. So it's a kind of, it could be a quick starter exercise in a lesson where you ask students to think about what the um, generic differences are between different genres. So 
without looking at specific texts, so a particular poem and a particular drama, you can just think in general, what do the differences in these kind of, what are the differences in these genre? So poetry is shorter, denser, conciser, typically. And drama is typically a much longer text. So these are generalizations. But um, if you are, if your students are doing coursework where you have got um, texts of different genre, then again, this, like the novel grid, acts as a kind of prompt for them to think, what could I be looking for? What points could I be making? Is this poetry typical of all poetry? Is this drama typical? Um, so or something like words being chosen for their individual effects in poetry. Could you argue in the drama that you're reading that that particular playwright is also incredibly focused on every single word? <clears throat> so um, you can do the same exercise, obviously, with any uh, genre combinations. And I guess you could do it also with um, sub uh, with genre within genre, so different types of novel or different types of poetry. So that's kind of a way to get students thinking in a more general way before they look at the particular texts that they're doing. So that works well if um, everyone in the group are doing different text combinations, but you want to get them thinking about um, their, their methods of approaching their analysis. Okay, and let's just have a look at resource seven. So when you're studying literature, and in particularly for the coursework, there are certain skills that are fundamental to, be able to, be, to being able to do it well. And so one thing that you could set up actually at the beginning of year 12, and it could work all through um, year 12 and year 13, is to raise awareness of what those skills are and to have a way of tracking how good the student is at them. So this kind of there are eight things that a uh, student needs to be able to do. So express an argument clearly, link the argument to the essay title, write accurately, etc. So this is a way of giving student, a student sort of more regular feedback about how they're doing in relation to those. And it can obviously be helpful in keeping students focused and, and uh, on track through their A-level studies. And obviously, it's also quite helpful for, um, you know, progress reviews with students or their parents, um, because it gives you a con kind of concrete sense of where you are and, and what you could, what you need to be doing more of. Okay, so um, those were some initial resources to help you through the whole coursework project. Um, let's just say a little bit about referencing. So the A-level coursework is, is maybe the first time that students will be required to, in a more technical way, cite, I use citations or quotations and say where the information has come from. Um, there's a section in, there's an example in the Getting Started Guide of how to draw up a bibliography. In terms of um, referencing within the text, um, we obviously don't want to be overly pedantic and expect university level complete accuracy, distinguishing between, you know, articles from a periodical, newspaper articles, um, full text, etc. So it's not necessary to be technically very perfect, but it is uh, essential that every single quote or idea that has come from somewhere else that um, you as a teacher and ultimately your moderator or us as an exam board can follow up where that came from. So the most simple method of um, referencing is simply to use the surname of the author of the material and the page for, um, within the body of the text. So you you write the quote in your own writing or you mention the idea and in brackets afterwards, you put the surname of the author and the page from the particular text 
um, thereafter. And then the full details of that text will be in the bibliography. And if you give a student an example of a bibliography like the one in the Getting Started Guide, they can simply follow that step by step, um, follow the pattern of you know, author, text title, year of publication, uh, publisher, etc. Um, so it's obviously possible to do exercises with that. But uh, as long as you as a teacher can find out where they got things, um, that's fine. Um, let's think a little bit now about planning to write to a suitable length. So I do regularly hear from teachers who say, oh, what can I do? Uh, I've got this really bright student, but they've just handed in their coursework and it's 6,000 words. Do I, do I have to go back to them and tell them that they have to cut it down? Um, that's a kind of difficult situation and it's, it's always tricky. Um, so what we want to do is set it up so that that doesn't happen at all. So what can we do to prevent it? So first of all, after the students have read their texts, a really good exercise is to get them to write a single sheet plan. It could be on an A3 page, for example, that, that puts down their intentions about what they're going to say in the coursework um, in a very broad brush style. As they then write, they should be ticking off what they've done and um, checking back, thinking about, right, how many points are there on my plan? Are there six? Are there eight? Um, have at least two midway checkpoints where they review, am I covering all of the AOs? You can check this by getting them to highlight the AO coverage. So take pink and go through the whole coursework so far and highlight all the AO3. Oh dear, you can't find any. That's a problem. Before you go any further, start to integrate some AO3. What, half the essay is AO3? Okay, that must be too much because AO3 is supposed to be worth about 20% of all the marks. So um, encourage students to keep a, a mental or a physical record of where they are in relation to the AO coverage and their plan versus word count. Another good check is to effectively speed read what you've written so far and one method of speed reading is simply to read the first and the last sentence of each paragraph and check whether you understand what the whole coursework is saying just by reading the first and the last line of each paragraph if it's well structured and cohesive and it's got introductory sentences to paragraphs which are flagging where the argument's going then um, you should be able to get from your own work an idea or someone else should be able to get the idea of, of where your essay is going and making sure it's going in the right direction. Then there are obvious things like checking your word count as you go along. If you're already at two and a half thousand and you have not yet put any critics or context in, then the work is getting unbalanced and you need to stop making further AO2 points and start thinking about the other AOs. Another way to encourage accuracy in length is to have a um, polishing your own style type input with your students, which is basically giving them a long paragraph of writing which is rather waffly and showing them physically on the board uh, how you can say the same thing in fewer words. It can be a competition, you know, this started off as 500, I can get it down to 200 with the same content, what can you get it down to? Um, and then also um, I've got another resource for you which you can use. This is for later on when the students are effectively finished. Um, this is a checklist. So let's just have a look at it first of all. So if a student's coursework were finished, then they would be able to say yes and tick 
every one of these 20 points. In my experience, when students think it's finished, they usually can't, they wouldn't be able to. So it may be worth um, building in a, a pre-submission checking session where the student sits with their own coursework which they consider to be finished their final draft and seeing whether they can tick everything in the in this on this grid so have they used an appropriate font and double spaced in an appropriate font size have they um, shown paragraphs consistently are quotes laid out correctly have they introduced properly any abbreviations of text titles that they've used and so forth so there's a whole series of questions if the answer's no to any of them then they should take the coursework away and not submit it until they're confident that it's yes um, again you can come back to the very final draft and get them to check their AO coverage with highlighters you can also get them to check their cohesive devices their discourse markers to make sure that um, the start of paragraphs are linking back to the title and that the essay focus remains clear throughout and um, sometimes students can get a bit sidelined on um, things that are around the text and forget the need to do some really good paragraphs of extended analysis of language so can they point in their essay to paragraphs where they engage for an extended period with language analysis rather than just quoting a similar a random simile with a comment for example okay so that's designed to help students help themselves um, and let's move on now feedback so another very frequent question is is how much am I allowed to say to students what can I do obviously if you've done the things that we were just talking about if you've got students to do that checklist and they've analyzed their own work and seen uh, areas that need improvement etc then um, that's done a lot of your work for you which is great a very important thing i think is to be absolutely clear from the outset with students how many times that you're going to look at their work and um, what feedback you're going to give them what's allowed because if students know for example the norm which is that you will only ever look at one draft of their work so they may submit their work to you once in an unfinished state or ideally it they would think it was finished but they would then get some feedback from you and might realize that it wasn't but it's really important because sometimes teachers within the same school have got a different approach and then you get into scenarios where they'll say oh well I thought you were going to look at this three times so I haven't really finished doing X Y and Z yet so uh, now that I have will you look at my work again um, so what you're allowed to do I have listed for you here and that's from the JCQ rules so you are only permitted to give feedback at a general level uh, this is still quoting from the JCQ guidance so what advice and feedback can I give to candidates during the task taking stage you may review candidates work and provide oral and written advice at a general level and then allow them to revise and redraft general advice does not need to be uh, recorded okay so um, I have come to the end of the points that I wanted to raise with you so we now have some time for questions and answers 
if you would like to get in contact with me outside the um, area of this uh, particular uh, support session, then I would recommend following me on at Pearson Teach English on Twitter, um, because whenever there are any developments, I tweet there. Um, I'd also send out monthly email updates which uh, highlight new resources or training or any developments in relation to A-level English literature. So it's a good idea to sign up for those. And there's also the English subject page um, where you also find a lot of um, valuable support for delivering English qualifications from Edexcel. Thanks very much for taking part today. I hope you found it useful and I look forward to talking to you on another occasion. The very best of luck with getting your samples in on uh, the 15th of May for this year. And don't hesitate to contact me at teachingenglish at pearson.com if you'd like any further guidance. Thank you.